Yeah, so my name is Suyan, and I just started a new job as a PI at Flatiron Institute at Simon's Foundation, um, and also as an assistant professor at NYU. And thank you for having an opportunity to speak here. Um, as a new PI, I get asked uh, a lot what I'm going to work on, and I think it's a really nice, um, nice venue. So I guess um, I'll start with the, the premise. Um, a central question in understanding the brain is to describe how a collection of neurons or networks of such neurons implement behavior. And to understand this, we, we formalize behavior as functions of tasks in perception, uh, cognition, and action. And to understand how these tasks are implemented by the brain, we, we inspect uh, these brain activities that is experimentally extracted and discover plasticity rules to understand how these neurons learn. And the structure of these collections of neurons manifest themselves as representations and the collection of these learning rules as network learning dynamics. Um, and I am interested in, in neural networks as a model to understand neural circuits because we have full access to their internal representations and we can test the consequence of these learning rules rather easily. Now, in many ways though, these neural networks are still very much like a black box and understanding and interpreting how they operate requires uh, many new theoretical advances. And to do this, I have been using my training in, in physics and combine it with uh, techniques from machine learning to develop the theory of neural networks. And, and here, our overall goal is to use these model systems to develop theories that can guide experiments and understand and explain observed phenomena in, in biological data. And today I'll talk about three different but di uh, related approaches which I have been working um, on towards these goals. So the first is the theory of neural population structures. And here we develop the theory of task efficient neural population geometry to, to answer how we can interpret high dimensional neural activity and connect it to the implementation of behavior. And second, using the geometrical insights uh, from the first theme to, to understand structure in neural, neuronal networks um, from deep networks to neural data. And finally, uh, my recent work has been on developing biologically plausible synaptic uh, plasticity rules that can work effectively on a network level as well. So let me jump right into the first theme, the theory of neural manifolds. So let's say we're given a stimulus, like a picture of a dog here, and a population of neurons responds to, to the stimulus, which then can be represented as a point in, in a neural state space. And in, in this cartoon, you'll, you're seeing this in three dimensions, but this is typically a fairly high dimensional space because there are many neurons. Uh, now, this was about a static object, but we know that in real life, uh, these objects can move around and rotate um, and so on. Um, so now imagine a, a, some stimulus variability like rotation or location. Uh, when what happens, so let's say a picture of a dog gets rotated and what happens then then uh, in this rotation example, you get then different neuronal population responses at each angle um, and get the geometric representations or manifolds in the neural state space because the representations are moving around with um, these latent variables. So, so these neural manifolds are um, a direct consequence of uh, uh, structures in single neurons. So for example, neurons can have tuning curve properties, we, we, which we think of as a basis for neural coding. And in the manifolds from the populations of sharply tuned neurons will look differently from um, the ones from weakly tuned neurons. And here, uh, our hypothesis is that if we can decipher the structure and functional or computational role of these neural manifolds, then we can learn something about cognition and task implementation. And indeed, there has been a lot of exciting work in this field on the structure of task representations in neural populations, both in neural circuits and network models. And these observations are coming from not only the sensory systems, 
but also in motor systems and in uh, higher cognitive areas like prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. Uh, and by the way, I, I recently wrote a review paper about this trend um, on neural population geometry in current opinion in neurobiology with Larry Abbott. So please take a look if you're uh, interested in the full view. So a lot of us are excited about the prospect of using neural manifolds to understand cognition. And, and the specific approach that we have been taking is the following. First, um, can we build geometric measures to characterize these task encoding neural populations or manifolds? Second, can we connect these geometrical measures with the task efficiency or, or performance? To answer these questions, let's consider invariant object recognition as a, as a task. Now, invariant object recognition refers to the brain's ability to distinguish between objects across stimulus variabilities like sizes or orientations or different positions. And it's one of the most commonly solved tasks by the brain. So first, we want to represent this invariant object recognition problem in the manifold or neural state space. So let's go back to our dog manifold. And remember how we went from a static a stimulus to a point, but with variabilities, it became manifolds in neural population space. Then what happens if we have another object class with like a cat that's moving around? Um, in this case, a set of neurons respond to two different objects. And a dog and a cat with variabilities become um, two manifolds in the, in the neural state space. So now you can represent a task of discriminating dogs and tasks, uh, cats, as a problem of separating between these two object manifolds. And in geometric terms, it means if we can draw a plane between these object manifolds, then we can separate them. Uh, and sometimes I'll, I'll refer to this as a linear discrimination, and it just means that we want to discriminate with a straight hyperplane, which is an assumption. Um, and you can hopefully already start to see what questions we can ask here. For example, how crowded can we make these manifolds before they're no longer separable? And what are the roles of degrees of freedoms or dimensions or sizes of these manifolds in how these manifolds can be packed up? And more broadly, can we quantify and formalize the linear separability of these object manifolds and connect it to the geometry? So as it turns out, there's already a well-developed theory of linear classification called the theory of perceptrons from theoretical physics and also computer science. Um, and here, the capacity of a perceptron refers to the maximum number of points per neuron that can be linearly classified. Um, but unfortunately, this is about discrete points, uh, a single instance of a memory. So in other words, I might recognize you at the second, but this theory won't be able to tell you if I will still recognize you if you move just one inch away. And in real life, we have to overcome these changes in the stimulus space all the time. So we need a perceptron capacity for classifying manifolds for real life problems of object recognition because each of these object manifolds can have infinitely many points in, in principle. So this is what we developed with Heim Sompolinsky and Dan Lee, the theory of object manifold capacity, which tells you the, the maximum number of object manifolds you can discriminate per neuron. So now the, the counting units for capacity is number of manifolds rather than number of discrete points. So what I think is so powerful about this theory is that it's both multi-level and analytic. And I'll explain both of these aspects as we go on. So uh, first it's worth talking about what capacity here really means. So there are several interpretations of this object manifold capacity. First, it's about how easy it is to discriminate uh, between real life objects. And also it tells you about how many categories uh, invariantly can you remember? Um, so it's uh, also a bit about the, the memory capacity. And it's, it's also about per neuron information content about object classes. So it's about how efficient the neurons are in representing object classes in a given neural population. So it's a, it's a density like property on, on efficiency of neural population. 
Um, and we use a step back approach from theoretical physics called replica theory, which allows us to calculate this manifold capacity explicitly. Um, and I won't explain this full equation term by term, but instead um, looking at the simplified form of this equation, we see that the manifold capacity can be expressed in terms of each object manifold's geometrical properties like manifold dimension and manifold's effective radius on an imposed margin, which is a distance from the hyperplane to the worst manifold. And let's take a full view of what this theory gives us. Um, so the key results of this object manifold capacity theory is that there are four properties that matter so far. Um, I think we could probably make it more complex going forward, but um, what we have so far is um, a manifold capacity is a task level measure that tells you about how separable these categories are in, in given representation and how, cat, uh, and how many categories you can invariantly classify and discriminate but this will be affected by the geometrical properties of neural activities. Uh, now that's characterized with each category manifolds dimension and radius. So dimensionality is a huge topic in neuroscience and there are a lot of different definitions for it. And here, this is a dimensionality of each category manifold relevant for um, linear discriminability or capacity. Same for radius. There are many different ways to measure the size of some data, but here, this is the measure for the size of the manifold that's relevant for uh, linear discriminability. And it turns out in reality, you also need to take into account the correlations in the data. So you can think of correlations as the similarity between different classes. So for example, a cat and a lion are more correlated in their uh, uh, locations of manifolds than a cat versus a car. So to a first order approximation, including the correlations between centers of object manifolds makes the theoretical method work. So how are these measures related and what does the theory say? The two scenarios that we care about are first when the object manifolds are highly tangled um, or, uh, and, and inefficient and unstructured versus nicely untangled in, in neural population space. So first, when it's highly tangled, the theory says that the manifold capacity will be low, and that's usually driven by the high dimensionality or large sizes of the object manifolds or high correlations between them. And the intuition here is that um, it's simply too hard to pack big and high dimensional um, correlated object manifolds into the neural state space. And you might see this kind of representations in early regions of sensory processing or, or before learning. And you'll see some of these examples in the next section. On the other hand, uh, if the object manifolds are well separated, then you can classify many of these categories. So the manifold capacity will be high. And if you have high capacity, uh, to, to have high capacity, you need to decrease object manifolds dimension, radius, and make them uncorrelated. So the, the intuition here is a little bit like uh, sphere packing or uh, packing in physics, where given the size of a uh, box, and if you're trying to pack um, big balls versus uh, flat disks that are small, you will be able to pack more um, lower dimensional and small things. And it turns out that in the, in the representation space, we can say the same, similar things about the, the neural manifolds. Uh, I should note that these geometrical properties, they don't always uh, move together. So you could have a high dimensional, but tiny noise like manifolds or low dimensional, uh, but almost flat curved long manifolds. But what's fun about this theory is that it will capture how these uh, different geometric properties will combine together to determine the capacity. So to summarize, the theory of neural object manifolds can be used as a multi-level uh, probe for neural population. Uh, so let's say uh, we're given input stimuli, rep, uh, like, like pictures uh, with categories, and then, and then you'll have responses to these stimuli with category information. Uh, so, so these, these uh, manifolds don't necessarily have to be smooth, meaning that it will work with experimental data. 
Um, and given the representation, this method will compute geometrical properties and predict the manifold capacity. And this has interesting implications for neuroscience and, and machine learning. Um, so first, neural manifolds can provide mechanistic underpinning for task implementation and pro provide a population level hypothesis and scenarios because even under the same capacity or behavioral performance, you can actually have different combinations of geometrical, um, um, geometrical properties. So you can, you can make a slightly more precise statements about, about neural representations. And uh, this neural manifold geometry is a consequence of collective properties of neurons, like tuning curve structures uh, and their distributions. So by connecting the representation geometry with performance formally, uh, we're one step closer to understand the role of individual neurons to task implementation. Um, so in the next section, I'll describe how this works by demonstrating this in deep networks and neural data. So theme two is understanding population structures in, in distributed neuronal networks. Uh, there are many recent reports showing the representational correspondence between artificial neural networks and neural, real neural circuits. For example, the work by Yamins and DiCarlo have shown that task-trained deep networks uh, can predict neural activity pretty well in macaque ventral stream. And it's also been shown that neural population structure and geometry are also quite similar to the biological data. Um, so if these neural networks are so good at predicting the brain data and quite similar in their structure, then why don't we study artificial neural networks as a surrogate system for neural circuits? The challenge here is um, that while deep network models might be uh, uh, good models of the brain, understanding how and why representations and task performances emerge in an interpretable way, it, it still remains a challenge. But we should still take advantage of this opportunity of having full access to everything in the network um, to get a mechanistic understanding of how behavior or task functions arise from the models building blocks and representations. So to do this, we use neural manifold framework as an intermediate descriptor connecting representations and task performances to understand neural networks as, as, a, as a model system to understand the brain and also as a test bed for new analysis tools for neural data. To this end, we have applied several geometric techniques to study various problems, going from vision to, to addition and also language systems. Uh, and all of these models are known to predict neural data. Um, and some more work on representations for hierarchy in language and also experimental data like macaque ventral stream data from the Carlo lab, and <clears throat> also to understand learning dynamics and generalization behavior to, to develop a, a better theoretical under, understanding of how deep networks learn. And today I'll highlight two recent studies in vision and addition as an example. So let me start with the work on understanding pre-trained visual deep networks. The goal here is to use manifolds to understand how deep networks process information layer by layer as a test bed for neural circuits. Now, AlexNet is one of the standard deep networks to study vision, and um, they're also shown to predict the uh, uh, primate visual cortex and neural data pretty well. So let's use that as an example and use ImageNet data, again, a very common benchmark data set for vision. And with ImageNet, uh, we can simply define um, object manifold as pictures that belong to the same object class. So dog photos from a dog manifold becomes a, a convex hull of the dog, um, dog manifold and so on. And also make another version of manifolds by taking a single image and moving it around smoothly, like changing the, the angle and, and, and um, uh, locations and so on. And we run these images on AlexNet and we can extract features similar to extracting real neural data and recover object manifolds from, uh, from these representations. And we're, we're ready to apply the neural manifold theory. Uh, and next we can, we, we ask how uh, discrimination occurs across layers um, uh, gradually. Now, before going further, we should first check uh, as advertised in the, in the first section, 
this uh, manifold replica theory predicts the um, empirical manifold capacity pretty well. So I should add that the, this manifold classification capacity can be measured empirically without knowing um, any replica theory as well by assigning random labels and looking for uh, the fraction, the point at which uh, you go from uh, being mostly inseparable to mostly separable. Uh, but we can check that the theory works with this kind of data, uh, which is a good sanity check. And second, we can follow the capacity and three geometrical um, parameters across each layer. So these uh, capacity moves as, uh, as predicted. So it increases across the layers of deep networks. And it seems that it is because of the reduction in the dimensionality and radius and correlations between object manifolds. So with the full access, to the information content and geometric summaries that we have at each layer, we wondered, can we understand what each layer of this network um, does? And, and can we check these properties before and after certain network components or certain uh, layers? So to do this, we focus on common circuit motifs of the network. For example, a ReLU layer, which is a short uh, for rectified linear unit inspired by a neuron's activation function for firing and show how the, the said geometrical properties of object manifolds change before and after this layer. So here I'm showing on the y-axis uh, the change in the dimension and on the, uh, the x-axis I'm, cho I'm showing the change in the correlation between the manifolds. And remember for increasing capacity, we want to decrease the manifold dimension and decrease the correlation. So we want to be on the negative negative quadrant. But if you look at the data, you see that the, the ReLU activation tends to um, have uh, the most of uh, its effect on the top left um, quadrant, which means that ReLU activation decorrelates, which is good, but um, object manifolds become higher dimensional as a result of uh, the ReLU operation. So this ReLU layer does something good for decorrelating, but it comes at the cost of increasing object manifold dimension. And you can do this for other types of layers and radius um, as well, and, and other uh, geometric properties. And I'll summarize the results in the table in the next slide. So this is what I just showed you, the dimensionality with ReLU, dimension goes up and correlation goes down. Uh, and you can do this for the radius, which also goes down. So this shows that activation nonlinearity layer reduces two properties, two geometric properties at the cost of increasing um, dimension. And you can do this for another neural nonlinearity. So for example, a max pooling unit, which pulls incoming firing rates and transmits the maximum firing rate. Uh, and it, it turns out that it reduces both uh, manifold dimension and radius, but it increases center correlations between manifolds. Um, so it turns out with just a single layer of um, same units, there's a trade-off in geometric, geometric properties. Interestingly, there, uh, there are common circuit motifs, uh, like a combination of a convolution layer, followed by ReLU layer, followed by pooling, which is inspired by simple cells, activation and pooling nonlinearity. And if you look at what they do together, these motifs um, change the object manifolds favorably in all three parameters. So this, in my view, is a unique and powerful application of um, neural manifold theory to understand what each layer does. To summarize, uh, geometrical way of thinking uncovers uh, mechanisms underlying favorable circuit motifs uh, and then their combinations and the limitations of a single layer of homogeneous units which, which have implications for the role of different cell types, perhaps. Uh, and more generally, this shows the power of neural manifolds as an intermediate level descriptor between task implementation and representation structure. And I know I'm biased, but I do think that we're just starting to scratch the surface of what we can do um, here. So after identifying uh, geometrical roles of circuit motifs, then we started thinking we can probably impose additional neural constraints on, on the network and understand the role of those um, neurally plausible constraints from the neuroscience perspective. 
And to this end, we studied the role of neural noise or stochasticity in a phenomenon called adversarial robustness. And let me explain what that is. And this is a collaboration with the labs of uh, Jim DiCarlo and Josh McDermott at MIT. So let's say we're given a standard image uh, like this one, it's a panda image. And both humans and artificial um, neural networks can recognize it as a panda. But if we add a very small perturbation to, to the image, like an epsilon size uh, random addition, um, and the network is very confident that it is a gibbon with 99.3 confidence, while to us, it still looks like a panda. Um, so this is uh, an interesting test bed because it is a case where we see a, a divergence between artificial neural networks and humans with humans performing much better than artificial networks. Now, it turns out if you make the network more like the visual cortex by, by adding a front end based on the classical linear nonlinear Poisson model, um, it makes the network suddenly uh, more robust to the adversarial perturbations without having an expensive adversarial training. And this is a result shown by Jim DiCarlo and coworkers. And, but, but it wasn't clear why and how this happens. Um, and in addition, prior reports on, uh, on in, in the literature of adversarial robustness, um, it, uh, the role of noise were somewhat conflicting, including the earlier work in the field reporting that random perturbations don't quite help adversarial robustness. So, so what's going on here? So this is where it would be great if we can geometrically understand how adversarial perturbations are affected by neural constraints, such as neural noise. And we can, in fact, define adversarial perturbations as manifolds. And also, we can define noise as clouds around each image. So, and, and with this, we identified two interesting geometrical effects that compete with each other. The first, the positive effect. When we add noise, noise clouds around a clean image and the noise clouds around adversarial perturbations, they start to overlap. And this overlap uh, drives adversarial robustness because it's as if you're making training and the test distributions more similar by adding a noise. But clearly having too much noise must be bad for class separability from the capacity perspective. So there's a negative effect which, which you can see geometrically with the manifold theory. And I think you can see where I'm going with this. These competing effects of geometry result in non-monotonic relationship uh, with a peak in adversarial performance versus the, the amount of noise. And finally, um, the optimal level of noise for performance should be predictable from quantifying these geometrical effects. And indeed, we find a high correlation between predicted and observed optimal level of noise now, these two effects seem intuitive, but finding a quantitative balance between these two forces is hard to do without precise geometrical measures. Further, these manifolds uh, are general, so we should be able to see this kind of phenomenon in other modalities as well. Audition is the modality where we were able to show the similar geometrical phenomena um, to, to visual systems in the past, so this is a good place to look. And we worked with Josh McDermott lab and coworkers to, to inject similar kind of neural noise to an auditory deep network model, um, which by the way is previously shown to predict uh, human uh, auditory vortex data. And it, it turns out it, it renders adversarial robustness again with, without explicit training. And the, the underlying geometry is also very similar. So let me summarize the two results from section two. Uh, first, we showed a layer by layer understanding of how networks process information through geometry to support their tasks. And second, we saw that um, geometry helped us understand the role of neural noise on human-like traits such as adversarial robustness. And in both of these problems, I want to highlight a few things. So first, there were competing effects between geometrical properties, and this is hard to probe unless they're good measures. Uh, we can always uh, visualize it to get good intuitions, but to check exactly what the role of each layer on the role of each parameter, we need to have uh, good quantifiable measures of underlying neural manifolds relevant for the task. And this is the focus of our work. 
Um, and second, these geometric interpretations are general across modalities, as you can see uh, from going from vision to audition. And it helps discover unifying and common phenomena across different regions of the brain and across different spatial and temporal scales. And this, I, I believe, is why um, neural manifolds as a population level descriptor is such a powerful framework to connect different scales. And I think it'll eventually help us get closer to understand the neuronal basis of behavior and cognition. Uh, and then this is my last theme for the day, which is a recent and ongoing work. Um, while deep networks are, have been excellent models of the brain, back propagation, uh, most commonly training, uh, used uh, training algorithm is, is uh, not biologically plausible. And this is because implementation of backpropagation requires the synapses in an intermediate layer to have the knowledge of the connections from that layer all the way to the output layer, regardless of how many layers are between them. And meanwhile, traditional plasticity rules like heavy and learning is more biologically plausible. For example, they're local, uh, but their performance is quite bad at common cognitive tasks. So there has been a lot of recent effort in in deep learning and neural community trying to understand the nature of biologically plausible learning rules that are also highly performant. And my recent and ongoing work at Columbia has focused on developing bioplausible learning rules that can work um, well also for the network training, uh, particularly focused on locality. Um, and to do this, we've incorporated new experimental findings from synaptic plasticity into the designing of uh, uh, network architecture and learning rules. And this is a collaboration with Larry Abbott and David Clark. In recent studies in electric fish, it's been shown that continual learning, in this case, a constant prediction of an incoming stimuli, occurs in regions that show two types of spikes, broad and narrow spikes. And, uh, and these are used for different purposes. Uh, broad one is used for learning and the narrow spike is transmitted downstream. And this got us to think, what if one signal type is doing a local prediction and another signal type is an activity sent to the postsynaptic neuron? And with these two representations in one unit as an architectural principle, we designed a new learning rule where um, the update to the synapse is determined by a product of presynaptic activity and postsynaptic local error. And with these principles that I just mentioned, we designed a network that's capable of local learning with theoretical guarantees such as convexity, meaning each neuron learns optimally with whatever, whatever information is available to them. And we also threw in a few components into the network, such as input dependent inhibition to improve the network's expressivity, which has beneficial implications in context dependence and collective behavior in small brains, but I won't go into the details here. Um, interestingly, along the way, we found another class of uh, uh, bioplausible learning rule where local error is swapped, uh, the local error here is swapped with an output error which can be thought of um, as, a, as a broadcasting of an error. And uh, theoretically, um, if you have some additional constraints like non-negativity of, uh, of weights, this turns out to be a local approximation of backpropagation rule uh, without the complex knowledge of connectivity that the backprop requires. And as it turns out, this hybrid learning rule is highly effective um, where the performance gets really close to state of the art um, in, in few benchmark uh, tasks in machine learning. And this, is, this work is now published in NeurIPS last year. And the theory also makes an interesting prediction that local learning um, will result in, in the more um, uh, robust intermediate layers in terms of the readout performance compared to the back propagation where the, where the efficient, and good, uh, efficient representation and good performance is focused only on the last layer. So this work has uh, exciting implications uh, where you can see that experimental findings and theoretical thinking together can uh, give forth, bring forth a new class of um, uh, bioplausible learning rules that are scalable to complex tasks. And combining that with neural network implementation generates new experimental hypothesis for candidate learning rules with implications for comparing different brain regions perhaps. 
Um, so with this exciting early work, um, the, the, this is one of the future directions that, that will be fun to pursue. So here are some of the published and ongoing work, which I just talked about during this talk in case you're interested. Um, and taken together, we're very excited to continue using uh, these related approaches where the geometrical approach combined with um, theoretical physics tools provide a theory connecting population structure with encoded task information. And this geometric theory allows for characterization of high dimensional neural data. And neural data can also provide inspirations for additional neural manifold theory and continue developing models and learning rules inspired by neuroscience um, and open the black box of these networks uh, when it's hard to understand with, uh, with population level analysis techniques like neural manifold theory. So, um, so there's a lot of exciting directions going forward. Um, I'll just keep it short here. Uh, first, continue developing the theory of neural manifolds and perhaps expand it to um, different types of tasks. Um, and second, uh, using uh, population level analysis tools such as neural manifolds to understand biological and artificial uh, neural networks. Um, and finally, uh, my last name is uh, building neural networks and develop learning rules as models of neural circuits um, and which is closely uh, connected to the first two themes. Um, and just to recap, we started this discussion with the theory that connects the neural population data at the representation level to the task efficiency. And the first theme um, um, would is extended this kind of concept to many more tasks and including continuous variables and uh, dynamic tasks and eventually multitask representations. Um, and and uh, the interesting, uh, Directions in the second theme is to characterize brain regions and neural network models with this kind of method and connect the perhaps neuronal properties to representations and tasks. And uh, the, int the in interesting future direction for the third theme is uh, more focused on model building and learning, but it still fits in this multi-level framework. So taking together these three approaches build on the work that uh, I have already done to construct an integrated description uh, connecting neurons to representations to task behavior. And I think there's a, an interesting potential to have a general multi-level uh, description that can extend many tasks, um, uh, extend to many tasks in multiple brain regions. Um, and with that, the work presented here was only possible with the support of many mentors and collaborators and um, students. And thank you for your attention. Um, and we're hiring at, at Flatiron Institute and, and NIU, so please reach out um, if, you, if you like this kind of work. <laughs>